Hello everyone, hi again. Um, my name is Rupa, Cumulus Networks. I, Cumulus actually uh, um, creates a distribution, a NOS for Switch ASICs, and uh, that's why we're involved in hardware offload of Switch ASICs. That's what I'm going to be talking about, sharing a little bit of updates from that world. So, just a general Switch ASIC offload updates, just like what we did last year or the last NetDev. There have been many things going on. I know there are many DevLink updates. Um, there are many developers here who have had who have made those updates. There are references to them. Uh, one is uh, health centralized uh, device health via DevLink, and this is the same API that Julie talked about in the NetLink workshop. And then there's um, DevLink parameters and abstract uh, config way to pass configuration parameters to drivers. So DevLink is sort of becoming the NetLink uh, hardware driver API. And then the last of switch walks with move, move to notifiers. So it's strange, about five years ago, we <laughs> did the first talk about switch dev in, at NetDev and introducing switch DevOps. And over the years, with years with experience, we've learned that notifiers, uh, which are async events in from subsystems to which drivers can leverage. So I know MLXSW, that is the Mellanox which is a driver in the kernel, uses a lot of uh, those oh. notifiers. And slowly, most of the switch type ops have been moved to those notifiers. So we saw the last one getting moved like, last week or something. Okay, so there are multiple topics um, uh, being discussed uh, on NetDev. One is linked up reasons. Yeah, I have some vested interest in uh, linked down reasons. Um, there is a patch uh, series which is being floated by Peter um, from Melanox on L1 reasons for linked down. And as a NOS, link down, debugging a link down. The first thing what you do on a system is go and check L1. At every layer you go and check first L1 via each tool. And then you go and check if uh, MSTP or STP implementation has set the port down and that's why the port is down. Or bonding or 802 or 380 is not converging and that's why the link is down. So it's you go to each of these tools and check until you find a reason why the link is down. So I think uh, this having reason code for a link down being displayed in IP minus D link show or even ETH tool will be really useful. And this has been an ask from a lot of uh, people who use our systems. Actually, most of the switch ASIC vendors do support them. Uh, even protocol implementation uh, link downs like VRRPD or uh, MLAG, that is the multi homing switch side software, that can also put a link down uh, via the IFLA proto down attribute, that is a netlink attribute on a per link. So, so yeah, I know Peter is not here, but uh, I'm just. Uh, <laughs> no, he's here? Well, I've not met him. Okay. So, oh, hi. <laughs> so, he's from so, here. Really? Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I just wanted to bring this up. I think we've been discussing on the mailing list and we'll continue discussing, but uh, it'll be nice to have even protocol reasons uh, which cause a link down to be shown somewhere. So I know ETH tool is where people go and look. I know ETH tool was brought up on the list as well, whether uh, because link status is also displayed in ETH tool and having uh, display the link reason there will also be good, but single API to serve all purpose will be useful. Okay, hardware stats. Yeah, I didn't get the memo from the TC workshop. <laughs> I think you guys have talked a lot about stats. Andy, you can jump in. I know you talked about stats, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of stats uh, related stuff going on in the rest of the subsystems apart from TC as well. Uh, one is the RTM stats API. Uh, this API has been there since some time now. It's a Netlink API to get stats and the idea is to convert all the stats in the system to use this API if possible, right? So today the stats available there are um, the NetDev stats and 
the ones that you get from NDU uh, get STAT 64. And then um, bridge VLAN STATs, MPLS STATs. So all the new STATs that have been added are available through this new STATs API. And in this case, you, have, you can just query STATs in the kernel. Unlike the STATs that you get from the link dumps, this is efficient. Now, uh, Yakub, there are some patches from Yakub which try to add hardware stats to this. And again, there has been a discussion going on upstream, and um, I don't think those patches have gone in yet, but uh, it would be nice to not give up on ETH tool like stats, the custom stats that uh, ETH tool provides, which are really handy. And if those don't move to this API, then people will not leave ETH tool, and ETH tool will be, they'll start, they'll keep using it forever. So, So hardware flex stats or counters. So there is the switch ASIC supports um, something called flexible counters, which is a pool of counters which you can attach to any network endpoint on any network um, like VLANs or VXLAN per route. Um, and it, each counter actually provides packets and bytes counters. This has recently come up for us in context of uh, multicast routing it is very uh, useful to um, have counters, per route counters. And the way people are used to using these in other systems and other switch ASICs is by attaching a counter on demand because hardware resources are finite and you, if you're scaling to millions of routes, you don't want to be enabling stats on all those routes. Mm -hmm. So you can attach, uh, dynamically when you're debugging, you can attach a counter to a routing endpoint, for example. So kernel doesn't, Linux doesn't have that, for instance. I mean, there is no, we're not limited by hardware resources today. And stats are mostly enabled by default um, for net dev stats, but not, um, so it depends on subsystems. For example, VLANs, we do have VLAN stats in the bridge driver, and per VLAN, per port per VLAN stats as well, but these are not enabled by default. You have to enable them. Uh, I think MPLS is also a on demand stats. Now even routes, we don't want to enable routes by routes, routing stats by default on all routes. Obviously it has to be a per route um, counter. Oh, what's happening? Okay. Okay, getting kernel stats in parity with hardware stats, the main limitation is here now, the per route stats uh, again, and per forwarding, bridge forwarding entry stats as well. Um, again, this came, this, for, uh, this applies to both IP routes and IP MR routes, multicast routes. Um, and there is a bunch of global SNMP stats that are available today, like in no routes and out no routes, which need to move to the new stats API. That's something, uh, will work on, and I think these are only available, I don't know if they, were, they are available today via Netlink. There is a proc net SNMP file, which I think netstat minus s uses as well. So I think RTM stats API is the right place to uh, provide Netlink support for them. Some notes on uh, per route stats. Uh, this is, I'm not giving it much thought, but it, would be similar to something like NF tables, which is a per rule stat, uh, packets and byte counters. Um, probably a, yeah, I've not discussed it with David yet, but uh, some RTA attributes to carry these uh, routes. And today routes don't support a set counter operation. You can only provide a counter flag when you're adding the route, or you can use the replace command. So you can probably do that as well. And those are the examples. And IP route two minus S is usually how you dump counters for, for many of the commands in IP route two. IP MR stats today, actually, there is a IP MR stats, but it shows the usage, last used time. I think that is applicable to IP routes as well. The last thing I think is the hooks for hardware stats. Um, so we know that the NetDev stats has uh, the getStat64 goes in, uh, drivers do um, have those implemented and add your hardware stats to software stats. This needs to extend to bridge VLAN stats, for example. 
um, because these ASIC uh, drivers, they do maintain uh, VLAN stats. The same thing for a VLAN device in L3 mode, which is not a bridge VLAN interface. Uh, you can, pro well, you'll need to provide a hook in the 802.1Q driver as well. Same thing goes for VXLAN. I think we will see some of these stats, and I think MLX SW is the, probably the only driver that is uh, capable of getting those stats today uh, from hardware. And new route stats. Um, of course, when you have hardware counter resource management, um, well, when the software counter is backed by a hardware counter, then you will need some uh, way to say that uh, a particular hardware mm -hmm. counter resource is not available. And I think Yakub's patches uh, deals with some of that with partial stats from hardware or no stats from hardware and so on. So some of that infrastructure can be used, can be used here. That's all I have. Any questions so far? <laughs> Um, so, Rupa, when you say add hardware stats, does that mean expose hardware stats, or can we actually, or you're talking about actually adding new stats in the hardware, like programmable? Yeah, programmable. I'm talking about programmable stats and actually getting the stats. So, when you're querying for bridge VLAN stats today, even if it's backed by a hardware VLAN driver like the MLX SW. We don't have a hook from the bridge driver to get the grab the VLAN stats from MLXW. Right. So it's it's both a hook that's needed, but also what what the actual stats are, right? So if I want to create a completely new type of stat for a completely new type of protocol, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's separate from the hook. So the hook should yes. be generic to allow any sort of stats. Okay. Yes, yes. That makes sense. I had a question for MLXW guys, actually. Are you guys implementing VLAN stats anytime? Hardware VLAN stats? No? Okay. Maybe there are guys also over there. Well, maybe I don't know. It's fine. No? OK. So all, actually, all the Intel NICs support the VLAN stats, but you're right. Like There is no way to pull the stats yeah. out. And recently, Nikolai added uh, LACP. Well, LACP doesn't have a hardware uh, packet, but uh, VLAN stats for bridge drivers. So both global and poor VLAN. And most hardware supported. So OK. Cool. Thanks, everyone. driver with Jiri Pirko. Um, and today's topic, we want to talk about um, visibility of um, uh, packet drops inside the hardware. Okay. So I will give um, a background to make sure that we are all on the same page. Uh, I will give the motivation for what we want to talk about and the proposed solution. So what is a switch? The correct way to look at it is basically a server that has a really big PCI card attached. Um, and this 
really big PCI card as a switch ASIC uh, that does the packet switching instead of the CPU that is attached to this PCI card. Um, and the way we model it in the kernel is that each phone panel port is represented as an a device. Um, and this allows us to basically uh, magically offload the hardware data path into the ASIC. So if you take two ports and you put them in a bridge, we can forward packets between them based on the FDB, okay? Which is inside the ASIC. Um, so in this picture I show like different paths a packet can take inside the kernel's data path as well as in the ASIC. So for example, uh, a packet can do bridging, in which case it just goes from left to right, and there are, it can like, hit uh, ACL rules at ingress and egress, TC rules, uh, or the packet can do routing, in which case its destination and source mark needs to be replaced by the neighbor subsystem, and then it goes and does bridging again and gets out of the egress port. Or you can do VXLAN, so you go from the bridge to the VXLAN, you do routing in the underlay, and then go out. Or you can do IP and IP, in which case you do routing twice. And this is enabled by the Linux kernel, by different modules in the Linux kernel. Uh, and we basically reflect this data path into this uh, switch ASICs. Uh, so today, MLXSW supports Spectrum 1 and Spectrum 2. Um, so as you saw, the um, different packet can take um, different paths in the kernel and in the ASIC. Uh, and these paths can be potentially very complex. Like each module that you see here can uh, be very complex and can account for various drops of why a packet was dropped. Um, so today, when we want to debug the software data path and we want to understand why or where a packet was dropped, we have the tools to do it. But in case the packet wasn't dropped by the kernel and it was dropped instead by the switch ASICs, because really the point is that the kernel will not see the packets, the kernel will not follow them, the, and instead the ASIC will follow them, then basically we we have no way to know why the packet was dropped and why it did not reach its destination. Okay. So uh, I will cover the way that we can today monitor packet drops in the software data path in the kernel. And then I will go over the proposed solution for the hardware data path. Um, so when you want to drop a packet, you should really call a function called k3skb. And this uh, function has a trace point in it uh, to which you can attach a probe. And one model that makes use of this is drop monitor, uh, which was introduced in 2009 by Neil Horman. Um, and it works over generic netlink, and it, atta it attaches a probe to this uh, trace point and periodically it will send you uh, uh, from where uh, K3 SKB was called and how many times. Okay, so in this example you can see that uh, I think I had like um, 77 packets w that were dropped due to IP error and this is because uh, I inserted a black hole route that was dropping uh, these packets. Uh, another way to uh, debug these drops is by using perf and gathering uh, stack traces and then you can see all the perf uh, that the packet did until it was dropped. Okay. Uh, so in this case the packet uh, was routed and eventually dropped by IP error. It was IP received, then IP error, then came free SKB. Uh, but we lack this visibility when the data path is completely offloaded and um, when the packet forwarding is done by the switch ASIC. Uh, and one example I want to give is 
uh, a recent issue that I got in which uh, a certain user had like a spine or I don't know it was super spine maybe and uh, it was connected to uh, four top of rack switches <laughs> and in this picture you can see that actually only two links had traffic going over them uh, the, w the rest were idle and they noticed in their testing that when they disable these two idle links they, see, they still see uh, packet drops on the on links that supposedly shouldn't be affected okay uh, so for like a couple of milliseconds that they saw that uh, they had like major packet <coughs> loss and they didn't know why um, and we started debugging this issue and um, the immediate uh, suspect was the uh, driver but uh, I couldn't find any reason why this would uh, make the switch ASIC drop packets. And then I, I said, okay, this is very unlikely, but maybe the way that this routing daemon is, uh, is uh, implementing a route replace where it's going from four next stops into two is by deleting the old route with the four next stops and then inserting a new route with two next, next stops. Uh, and I said, ah, it doesn't make sense because then you have this uh, couple of milliseconds where there is no route, so packets are dropped. And when I looked at the code, this is exactly what I saw. So I knew uh, what was the problem, but only by eliminating other reasons. Uh, and eventually I had to look at this routing demons code. And this is not, uh, this is not FRL. Um, <laughs> well, well, it is if it's V6, but that's a different No, it was IPv4. <laughs> um, so during this period when, after you delete the old route and insert the new route, there is no route and packets are being dropped, and we didn't know why. Um, so we want to introduce a new mechanism that uh, will give us similar visibility to what we have and when we try to debug the software data path. Uh, and it relies on the fact that uh, your device that you're working with can send packets that it decided to drop to the host, to the CPU, okay? Uh, and tell you why it decided to send these packets to the CPU. Um, so today, uh, for example, um, um, each packet that is sent from the ASIC across the PCI bus to the CPU, we know exactly why it was sent. It can be like um, a route that is, uh, um, uh, is a local route and you want to locally receive these packets or uh, because some ACL is trapping these packets to the CPU. Uh, but another reason can be like no route or black hole route or ingress STP filter or ingress VLAN filter, okay? Um, so we have these packets coming from the ASIC with metadata of why the ASIC decided to drop them uh, and the ingress port and timestamp and <coughs> for some drops also the egress port uh, and all these reasons are like standardized, they are not proprietary reasons. They, I have a very l long list of reasons of why their device decided to drop a packet and for each reason I have a reference in the kernel that uh, says if this packet were to be switched by the kernel, this is where it would be dropped. Uh, and we want to allow the user to filter certain drops. Uh, for example, on some networks, uh, dropping packets due to a black hole route can be uh, normal and in which case you want to tell the uh, device, don't send us packets that you decided to drop due to a black hole route because this is valid. Um, so filtering based on individual reasons is one granularity, but uh, we also want to allow users to filter based on entire um, stages in the pipeline. Um, for example, uh, ACL drops or layer two drops or layer three drops or buffer drops. Uh, and these are all like standardized groups and standardized, 
standardized reasons that can be later on extended by uh, other users that have different use cases. Like I mainly focused on switch ASICs, but uh, the same mechanism can be used for also for e-switches uh, on hypervisors. Okay. Um, so just to make sure that we all understand the terminology, uh, when a packet is sent from the uh, ASIC, from the device to the CPU, we say that this packet was trapped. Okay, this, uh, I checked this is not only common to us, this is like uh, terminology that is used across different vendors. Um, and we, as I said before, we want to allow users to uh, filter certain drops or certain group of drops. And uh, this kind of configuration is um, specific to the ASIC. It's not specific to a net device, to a single front panel port. So uh, given that we need to uh, configure this mechanism, that this mechanism is um, specific to the ASIC instance and not to a port, then we think that uh, using DevLink, uh, the Drupa mm -hmm. mentioned, um, to configure it and monitor these drops is a good choice. And the way we envision this will look like is that the packet uh, will be dropped by the ASIC at the bottom, will be sent across uh, the PCI bus or whatever bus you're using um, to the CPU, uh, to the kernel. Uh, the kernel will see, okay, I got this packet because, I mean, the driver in the kernel will see, okay, I got this packet because it was dropped due to this reason and it will generate a Netlink message using uh, DevLink and send this packet to user space along with the relevant metadata, such as the drop reason, the ingress port, egress port, and so on. Um, so as I said, we want to use um, DevLink and the proposed uh, API is uh, to basically enable or disable the entire mechanism. It's disabled by default, obviously. Uh, and filter based on a group or a specific uh, trap. And if you want to monitor current um, drops, you can ju just do DevLink uh, packet monitor, um, which will give you the packet along with the metadata. And if you only want to get statistics, like uh, you don't care about individual packets, you only want to know like how many packets were dropped due to each reason, uh, we can use an eBPF filter on the Netlink socket and just uh, share mm. these uh, counters using an eBPF map with user space. Um, I also have like backup slides for um, the more low level API, the Netlink API, but uh, I don't have enough time and we can go over it later if you want. Um, and that's it. Questions? Start with Andy and then Tom. Oh, all right. Uh, so this is really cool. I like it. Um, I know Neil would be disappointed if we, you know, patch drop monitor too much. But uh, it would be interesting to think about unifying sort of the two, yeah. maybe. I mean, I, that's a, that'd be a, a longer term goal. I think this infrastructure is great. But long term, it'd be great if you could run drop monitor. And instead of just printing out like a line number and function, we could actually add some something along the lines of the uh, extended act message. We could come up with a standard format of, you know, drop because it was a black hole route. And that would be, uh, that would appear a drop monitor. And mm -hmm. that would work on hardware or software, for example. So I. You probably thought about this. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> uh, I considered using a drop monitor, but. Um, it has different uh, use cases than the hardware, I think. Um, and also, in most cases, we can do better than drop monitor. Because for example, due to the way the code is constructed in the kernel, the same line in the code uh, is used to drop uh, packets due to different reasons. For example, um, black hole routes, unreachable routes, no routes are all discarded in the same line of code. And we can differentiate between all of them, so. Yeah, I think that'd be a, an argument for 
improving the way the drop monitor works. Yeah. Because I agree with you. I've looked at it and thought, eh, which one of these is it? But yeah. Uh, also, the drop monitor doesn't give you the original packet for some reason. Only how many times uh, K-free SKB was called from each line. Yes, this this tracing infrastructure looks reminds me a bit to the IP tables. I mean, in IP tables you can enable trace. You can use the trace, trace. target, mm -hmm. and then you can see where the packet is going, what 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 rules are matching, or what's the reason, what's the rule that is dropping a packet. So I wonder if we could add something similar to the to the routing engine, for example. So you have a toggle that you can enable, and in, in, also using rules in in the routing using the IP route just to say, I want to trace. So you enable this routing, this, this tracing in software, and we map this to hardware. So it looks like this infrastructure is missing in 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 the route engine and in other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a ACL drops are also supported. But if you're using the TC action drop, like you want to know the path a packet took inside the ASIC? Th this is what you're talking about? You know, wh what I mean is just yeah, add similar tracing capabilities to other subsystems like um, route uh, to the route engine to TC. So just yes, through policy, you s the, the user can specify what kind of, what kind of traces yeah. he, he wants to get and then just map that to hardware, which is more or less what I have seen right now in your presentation. Uh, so I think it's a bit different. Uh, like I, I don't think we can give you specific points where a packet, uh, specific hooks in the hardware that where the packet went. Uh, we can only have specific, really specific reasons for why I decided to drop it. Uh, but I will look into it. Okay, um, yeah, so my concern about this, um, and it probably is pretty obvious, if I'm receiving nothing but packets that I'm dropping, and I'm trying to pipe all this stuff up into user space, obviously I'm gonna overwhelm the interface. Yeah. So I don't see how this could replace actual statistics um, in an operational use case. For tracing, it might be fine, but um, I'm dropping a million packets per second or whatever, there has to be statistics, and presumably, if I'm trying to find the needle in the haystack in those statistics, like that one instance of, of packets I'm really understanding, and everything else a denial of service attack, how, how do you weed that out other than we have the specific statistics? Or I figure, I don't, I don't even know how you would filter for the interesting stuff. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, obviously this, doesn't, this mechanism doesn't mean that we don't want to extend the counters that we currently have, and we want to expose more of them. Um, uh, it just needs, it just serves like a different purpose to tell you exactly why a packet was dropped. And regarding your comment about like uh, uh, millions of packets being dropped, so um, there we configure policies between the uh, ASIC and the CPU so that. Um, for each reason, uh, for each trap reason, we have a different policy that is saying how many packets uh, the ASIC is allowed to send to the CPU. So obviously, we don't want to eliminate statistics. We just want to um, uh, augment them with more data. 
Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hi. So, I'm Mario Ilio from Mellanox. Uh, used to be other companies, but Mellanox now. Um, and I want to describe the topic of. No, Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been Marvel for a short time, so. <laughs> you wanted to acquire a melon that it didn't work. Not, not me. It was um, a year ago. At that time, you were not Marvel. Okay, you were kidding. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to describe a, a, a problem, a topic that we've encountered, and some uh, measures of um, uh, dealing with it, recovering from the problem. Um, and. At least according to our understanding, this should be applicable to any hardware vendor. So also interested to know how other people, uh, if they've uh, encountered it and how they deal with it. Um, right. So um, I'll try to go quickly through defining what the problem is and its impacts, uh, some existing mitigations, but which, are, which help but are ultimately not sufficient and describe possible solutions and uh, what we did and how it ties into perhaps some other features, uh, time permitting. So uh, a doorbell is basically a short message for, from the host of the device updating the status of a queue. Um, <coughs> it could be an L2 queue or RDMA queue or a slow path queue. Um, it doesn't matter. A classic example is a producer update. Um, and there are many doorbelling entities, right? There could be many, many L2Qs or many, many RDMA QPs. Actually, I think that all's presentation is going to uh, de describe something that will increase the possibility of hitting this with more queues. Um, and what the problem that, we're, that I'm describing is, is when we have a large number of queues that are, are all sending doorbell messages, um, the DQ rate within the device, for, so all these, all these messages basically go into a queue in the device. And that queue gets DQ'd by the device as it's updating the queue context that it carries within it. Um, but there is a limited rate at which this can be. And even if it's a very fast rate that we're DQing the messages, uh, there's basically, uh, there's almost no bound on the incoming rate because you can always add more CPUs, stronger CPUs uh, to deal with this. And if, if you have all the CPUs of a very fast machine only sending um, doorbell messages because we have a very large amount of queues, uh, at some point um, we, the device might be losing doorbell messages. Um, so what happens if we overflow the queue and we lose doorbell messages? So this is just a diagram, right, showing the various different types of doorbelling messages, uh, doorbelling entities uh, that can reach the device. And by the way, these exist in very uh, in different uh, subsystems within the kernel, right? So uh, when I'll describe uh, possible mitigations and solutions, um, one of the challenges is trying to implement something across uh, you know all of these uh, locations in the kernel. So possible uh, impacts, if we do not uh, have any uh, recovery mechanism for losing doorbell messages, could be the L2 TX timeout watchdog, right? probably everybody knows. Um, uh, if it's an L2 or an RDMA, we can get, get a QP or CQ error. Um, if it's a slow path queue that had its message uh, dropped due to the overflow, then, then we have a slow path message timeout. Um, and the recovery procedures for these errors can be pretty painful. Right? A queue could close, uh, the entire uh, PF device would be reset, or the entire device would be reset. So uh, we definitely want to avoid these types of errors. So going quickly through some mitigations that already exist. So one of them is the uh, XMIT more and SKB, which is a very useful feature that basically lets the driver know that there are more doorbells uh, upcoming on this queue, so we don't have to send each one. Uh, and if we are able to um, send the information that we wanted to send on a door on, on 
on the doorbell for this packet at a later doorbell, then we can just avoid sending it. Right? Put the packet on the ring and not send the doorbell, um, throttling down the amount of doorbells that we're going to send due to this queue. But ultimately, this is not sufficient because there could be uh, more and more queues. Right? It, it only helps for this specific L2 queue. If we have uh, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of L2 queues, then basically the XMIT more doesn't help us at all. Uh, and similarly, in RDMA, uh, post list does something similar, single, queue, single doorbell for multiple messages. But again, if we have sufficient amount of queues, it doesn't help. Um, OK, so what can we do? We can be very fast, right? DQ really quickly. Um, but like I said, ultimately, uh, if we bring to the problem enough uh, compute power on the host side, uh, it's bound to fail. Um, Another solution, which is uh, pretty nasty, but can be done, is to stall the CPU from the device, device not returning credit um, on, like w when we're uh, getting near overflow, we can stop returning PCI credits, basically stalling the CPU on its PCI write. Um, but this would slow down, this would basically st stall the CPU, and obviously uh, it uh, has a bad effect on the system in general, especially if you're doing other things with your system, uh, it's not what you want. Um, and by the way, another possible solution that's not listed right here, but is sort of maintain uh, on the host, somehow distributed across all your doorbelling entities, the depth of that queue in the device and, and throttle yourself not to overwhelm it. But that's, uh, again, very difficult to scale to millions of doorbelling entities. It requires very deep uh, buffering. Uh, and is also not, uh, not a good solution because it's not scalable. Uh, and finally, uh, the solution I wanted to present is what uh, we've been doing in, uh, upstream recently, which is a recovery mechanism, recovery procedure in the driver. So there's a big assumption in uh, my recovery solution, which I don't know if applies to everybody, which is that the durable messages uh, are recoverable in the sense that if I discover that a few durable messages for a specific queue have been lost, I can resend the last one again, and it will be like an aggregative act, an accumulated act. Right? It will basically convey all the information for that queue to the device. So I don't have to find, to resend every message that was just to send the last one again, or last, the current state of the queue can be retransmitted to the device, and, and that's sufficient. Uh, assuming that is, that is the case, and you have a device that can get um, doorbells in this aggregative fashion, uh, then comes the question which, uh, so when we discover that an overflow happens, uh, which ones uh, do we want to uh, recover? And this really depends on the quality of the information that your device can, can deliver. If it tells you exactly which queues were overflowed or just that an overflow occurred and then you basically need to recover everyone because you don't know where the drop occurred. Um, now this solution might seem a little bit uh, strange, fighting fire with fire, because we lost, we're in a situation where we're losing doorbells, so let's re-doorbell all the queues again, so we're adding more doorbells uh, to the problem. But again, since they're aggregative, we're basically, um, e even if we lose a lot of the doorbells, even if we lose a high percent of the doorbells, if we keep re-doorbelling on all the QPs, we are updating the status for, for all of them. Um, so getting better information from the device on which queues need it is best. But even if we don't have that, uh, the solution works. OK, so up to here is just stating what the problem is and some of the solutions. Um, I'd like to hear if there are any questions. I'd also like to hear from the other uh, hardware vendors. If they also encounter this problem and have a I, um, I'm not sure I agree with your characterization of the problem. The, in case of doorbell overflow, if you're taking a modern CPU, we can run way greater than like a Gen 3 by 8 or Gen 4 by 16 type PCI connections, which means you will lose PCI credits. The moment you lose PCI credits, you've stalled the PCI root complex, which means now your NIC is dead. It's got nothing else going on, right? It's not just a CPU. It's not just a resettable condition, and you do not have PCI credit so that you can send the next doorbell update so that you can fix it. 
If, if your condition that you're hitting is the case that you could actually get it across PCI and enqueue it in the device fast enough, then and only then is your solution going to work. I, I accept that, but uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm to, I've encountered a real life solution, right? Where we're losing doorbells, but, but because that queue is overflown, but. Um, right, uh, so that's, a, that's an assumption of a hardware design that you have a leaky destination queue, right? Basically you're draining PCI fast enough that you can take the output out. Depending on your root complex, that may or may not always be true. Right. I, I accept that. This is very, so this entire thing comes from a specific hardware vendor, right? We encounter a problem and solve it. I'm really interested to hear about the other ones. Um, sure. So I guess all my high level comment is this gener won't apply generically unless and until you have this very special setup where. Right, but the, you're prob but the problem faster. is relevant for everyone. No, no. Well, the problem is very relevant. I mean, the current solution right now is you have a dead machine at the end of the day because you're out of PCI credits. Your only option is a reset, which is a root complex reset, which is a host reset at that point. Right. So any of the other hard hardware vendors have yeah, encountered the problem? Thank you. Uh, so in uh, Melnox devices, we don't, we don't back pressure the, the PCI. So it will, always ha it will always have credits for doorbells. That's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, we see doorbell uh, being lost is very rare. Uh, we still so we have hardware mechanism for that. So if if that will happen, we have hard hardware mechanism that it will recover itself and just continue. But how can it recover? The, does the hardware read from the host the doorbell state? The, because the state? we never stop the doorbell, so a part of the information is being kept, and it remembers that it has a doorbell, and then. And then, uh, so hardware fetches the information from the host? Hard yes. So you register with the hardware, the virtual address on the host that, that holds the... It uh, knows all its cues, so it understands uh, already how to, uh, wh wh where to fetch the doorbell. Right, okay. So th actually that's pretty similar to what we do, uh, although some, some of that is done in software. Uh, right? But, uh, so let me describe a little bit more in detail uh, sure. our own solution. Um, so basically what, I, what we've implemented is maintaining a database um, of all the doorbelling entities that, that we've got, regardless of whether they are for fast path or, or slow path for uh, RDMA or even for storage, um, where we get, um, register them all at setup and keep track of them. And so whether we are in, uh, in RDMA or L2 or even in the storage substance, subsystems, we also have storage drivers on this device, we just register um, the area on host which is keeping the um, durable state. This is registration with the driver, right? Not with the device. And um, when, this, when the problem occurs, we can traverse this list and obtain the queue data and read doorbell, uh, basically refreshing all, all of the doorbells with their uh, most current state. Um, and this is useful because this is sort of an under the hood solution in the sense that the doorbelling entities themselves, the L2 queues or RDMA queues or whatever, are unaware that it's happening. Only at um, creation or teardown, they need to register with the mechanism, but they're unaware um, that this is occurring. Um, right, so, a bit of a special case. So, question on that. How do you recognize the condition? How do you know that this condition has happened? So, we get an attention from the device. Right? The device can, can indicate that it, it, an overflow has occurred. Ah, okay. So, your condition, your trigger is that I actually went past end. Somebody wrote and it went past end of my queue. That's your trigger. So I also have an almost full threshold, which I can configure, right? Okay. But, uh, so I can react even before the problem happens. But okay, so you, you're signaling to the driver before you get to the, the full condition that you might have to re-signal me again. Right, so it's going to be Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So a bit of a complexity is the right combined buffer. Uh, some of you might know as, as a method, when, when the doorbell is basically not an atomic message of uh, uh, 32 or 64 bytes, but a, a 
full packet that's being flushed into the doorbell or some inline data. Um, but that can also be uh, handled if we uh, recognize that it happens and the device does not process uh, because the problem could be that we get partial messages, right? We get uh, part of a right combined message and the rest was dropped. Um, but that can be handled because the, uh, it, if we re-doorbell all the QPs again, it might not be a right combined message, but w there is a non-right combined or non-inline um, fallback for, any, for every such case. So I have time. Um, so just a um, few more seconds. So for few, so one of the things that uh, we've discovered from this is that getting more useful information from the hardware and exactly which QPs, um, or, or queues, or um, uh, doorbelling entities have experienced the overflow um, can make the recovery more efficient. Of course, we won't have to recover everything, but just those specific queues. Um, And the existing mitigations that, that, that we have in kernel, uh, so especially on, on Rocky, which, which is a great contributor to this problem. If you have a mix of L2 and Rocky, Rocky can easily uh, scale to millions of QPs. Um, unlike um, Ethernet, where the mitigation is basically always in place, the XMIT more is part of the SKP, uh, post list depends on the Rocky application, whether or not they use it. So use it more to avoid this problem. All right. Any questions? So <clears throat> the solution which you're proposing, the right combining buffer, if you use that, wouldn't you have partial writes and partial reads, those type of transaction on the bus right, more so the, frequently? The, so the point I was trying to make is that we already use right combined buffers, and the doorbell overflow problem um, leads us in this case exactly to that. To um, you might have half of a half of a right combined message, and then you've lost the rest. But because the at least in our case the um, in the inline cases where we use the right combined, we, we always put uh, backup in place, right? So we we put the the packet on the ring as well as sending it directly into the doorbell. So if this happens, basically device stops handling uh, right uh, right combined or inline messages, and we flush all of the existing ones and rely on the, on the packet that's already in the ring, right? So we lose the low latency that we might have had, but we maintain uh, correctness, right? So still the, the the correct data is handled by the device. Yeah. So in x86, it is handled through the posted writes. Right. Thank you. I was going to ask for a short technical extension, um, but yeah, that's just rubbish. So, <laughs> excellent. Um, so, uh, I'm Peter Jans van Vieren, um, work, working for Natronome, and I'll be talking about quality of service ingress rate limiting, um, which I assume I need to use this. So first off, let's just talk about um, QoS in uh, QoS for OBS, and particularly what we are going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about ingress rate limiting, rate limiting, or policing. So I might use those terms interchangeably, um, but I'm referring to ingress rate limiting. Um, what I'm not talking about is uh, oh, sure, sure. This doesn't complicate it. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, what I'm not going to talk about right now, and obviously we can, we can talk about the questions, is uh, the future work like egress rate limiting, flow-based uh, metering set with VR set Q or, or shaping on egress. So in terms of um, ingress rate limiting, um, we're talking about ingress rate limiting from the perspective of, uh, I'm too soft, I guess, uh, from the perspective of the hypervisor. Um, so that's the ingress traffic on, on tap zero. Um, in the in the diagram, I shamefully I shamefully stole this diagram just 
for what it's worth. Um, but you'll see the source later. Um, so let's look at OBS um, traditionally or, be or before uh, TC offload. Um, <coughs> if we configure a rate limiter in OBS without having TC offloads enabled, OBS would go and configure a, a TC filter with the basic classifier. Um, this is what it traditionally does, and then uses policing for, uh, yeah, for rate limiting. Um, so this rule is slightly cut off for what it's worth, um, but you'll see a, a, a more full dump later on. Um, now what OBS has done here implicitly is um, it's created an inherent priority. So our TC policer will <coughs> grab the packet first, get the packet first, and then only after it has handled the packet, uh, the kernel OBS data path gets the packets. Um, so there is this inherent priority already. Now, if we fast forward a bit and we enable uh, rate limiting, uh, enable TC offload, and we try again to um, configure a rate limiter, uh, OBS will reply in the logs very sneakily, um, policing with offload isn't supported, meaning that we can't support um, rate limiting when you have TC offload enabled. Um, so it ignores your rate limit. Now, just be warned. Um, now, yeah, so um, if we look at how to correct this or how to fix this, um, the first thing that you might think, uh, maybe let's go ahead and just remove this restriction and allow OBS to install this basic um, basic filter, but with uh, with TC offloads. Well, that's in, in insufficient, not sufficient. Uh, it's not going to work, and partly because, uh, well, mainly because um, this ordering issue, this priority issue, uh, we don't know which part of the data or which filter will get grab the packet first, and it will actually depend on when you configure your rate limiter. Um, so, we do need to introduce. Uh, priority somehow. Um, and additionally, a, a basic filter is not ideal for offload. We'd actually prefer something like match all or even the flower classifier. We decided on, in the meantime, we've decided on match all because it more closely follows the design of OBS. Um, so we've gone ahead with uh, match all <laughs> classifier type, but I mean, we, we, it's, it's feasible using a classifier as well for the rate limit. So, um, then, Secondly, what we did is we introduced the notion of priorities in OBS, um, re reserved priorities. So we've moved on our traditional TC data path, which, which is, by the way, is implemented with TC Flower, um, for, for those of you who don't know. But we've moved that on with a priority offset. Um, so all those rules will get installed at an offset priority. And we reserve the highest priority for something like uh, rate limits. Question? Um, so yeah, sure. So, where? Right, right, yeah. Ah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. reservation. What, what, okay, when you reserve, does the user have so access? Can the user install this, or you, you they have to go through the agent? Well, it, they, they go through OBS. So, okay. I do have an example um, okay. at the end. There's OBS scuttles right. that, that we will use um, sure. to configure. And I think that'll answer your question. Um, but, yeah, the user, the, the, the user of OBS doesn't see the priority. This is all in and handled by OBS. Um, okay. Um, so by doing this, we can then actually get hardware offload, um, which is which is great. And some vendors can do this already. Um, and unfortunately, we're not completely there. We're still left with two issues. And the first issue is um, what I like to call the software hardware issue. Is when your, tele uh, your TC policer is installed in software, um, but your subsequent filters that are at lower priority get, gets offloaded to SmartNIC. Um, this will, at very least, reduce performance. And when I'm talking about performance, I'm not just talking about throughput, because packets will need to fall back to, to the host for processing. So there's definitely a, a performance hit in terms of throughput that you'll take. But also, your CPU will now need to handle these packets which we dearly want to avoid happening. Um, so that's, that's the performance issue. Apart from that, if your smart NIC 
is not aware that this rate limiter is installed in software first, um, we could break semantics. So the packet will get to the smart NIC. It now needs to realize it needs to fall back to the host. And if it's not aware that it needs to fall back, it'll directly go to TC filters and just ignore your rate limiter without telling you. Um, so this could be a serious issue. Um, second issue is what I, what I call the hardware software issue. Um, that, and that's just the reverse. Um, again, we'll see lower performance. Again, packets will need to fall back um, to, uh, to the host, but at least then hopefully we've dropped some of them <laughs> because of the rate limiter. Um, but most smart NICs at least know when a filter has not been installed in hardware um, and know that it, it is in fact installed in software in terms of the TC data path. So in this particular case, uh, we, we, we still expect um, uh, smart NICs to function correctly or the, the system as a whole to function correctly. Now we do have two solutions. Um, we've selected the first solution just based on simplicity. Um, and it's for, in particular, we're not caring about the hardware software one because we're assuming the semantics is fine and you're gonna live with the performance hit. Um, but in the software hardware case, um, we've reverted back to the original semantics of not allowing you to install subsequent um, filters or uh, not, sorry. That's the second solution. We've reverted to the original semantics of not allowing you to install um, uh, policers when you, uh, uh, yeah, uh, saying policers is not an uh, isn't supported. But what you could also have done is you could have had OVS force all TC filters, all subsequent TC filters that implements the data path, to be installed in software as well. Sorry, that was a bit rough. Um, so now we get to the example, and I think Jamal, um, this, this should answer some of Jamal's questions, but this is just shamelessly stolen from the OBS documentation. So hopefully you guys will get the slide somewhere, be able to follow that, otherwise you can just look it up on the OBS website. Um, but um, essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to set up two VMs, we're gonna rate them at VM1 to one megabits per second, and VM2 to 10 megabits per second, then we're going to use NetProf to confirm uh, the, those results. And then there's just some useful scuttles that, um, or, or tools that we use along the way. Um, some of my favorite ones. Um, so enabling TC offload, this is pretty standard. Um, it's just hardware offload true, and then TC policy equals none. You could have also set this to skip software or other things, but by default, this is fairly the sta standard practice to to use uh, TC pass, uh, yeah, to enable TC offloads. Um, then we go and add bridges and interfaces. Um, so obvious scuttle, add BR0. Nowadays I call this BR exit, and then I delete it in protest. Um, but <laughs> uh, basically we just add our bridges, we add our interfaces, um, and you'll note that I've slightly edited the um, diagram to just represent our net depth names instead. Um, then this is where uh, Jamal's question comes in. So this is this, the uh, VS scuttle that you'll be using to configure um, the rate limiter. And this will translate to a match all uh, filter with police action um, with a priority of one in, in o from OBS to TC. Um, and then we'll offload that. Um, subsequently, what you'd go and do is configure your uh, flows. Now, um, in terms of configuring flows, you could have used normal here as well, but this is just a point to illustrate these we expect to be translated to uh, TC flower um, uh, filters, and uh, yeah, and they should u work in unison. So we then fire up netperf on VM1, net server on our measurement host, um, this is all just from the, again, from the OBS documentation, the OBS uh, example use case, and we see we get about uh, one megabits per second rate limits. Uh, we can repeat it on VM2, and we'll see 10 megabits per second. Um, then we get to see some of these useful cool tools. Um, so uh, OV, uh, VS Scuttle show just uh, shows us our interface names, which is uh, important for the next step if you want to see what rate limits configured to. 
Um, so you use list interface to see and go look for ingress. So this is just a grep on ingress police policing burst and rate to go see that. Um, and then this is probably the most important one. Um, this is our uh, TC filter show. It basically shows that we have a, a policer installed um, that uh, implements our rate limiter at high priority. And thanks to Jamal for pointing this out in one call, has action drop continue, which allows it to go to the next uh, high pri the next highest priority, which is our um, flower classifier with a simple merge redirect action. Yeah, and that's, that's it for me. Any questions? So, so actually the slide, the one that you show, is the um, maybe un unconventional or uncommon case where you, you drop from software data, how software data pass to hardware data pass. It oh. couldn't be a really yeah, 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 good yeah. production environment, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, Just, no, no it's, I'm not. You're, you're, you're completely right. Sorry, you're, you're referring to the not in hardware right. portion. Yeah, that, that should have been in hardware, apologies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that th this is actually one of the error situations. Yes. It's um, really hard to build production system where data pass packets go from hard to data pass to software data pass. It could be exceptional, not, yeah. 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 It's okay that the model supports that, but you should aim to avoid yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what it's supposed to do is both, it should be in hardware, obviously. Okay. Um, and if you go back to the first, if I get this thing to point correctly, I think this example had in hardware. I was just being inconsistent <laughs> and lazy. Um, so apologies, yeah, this, sh this should have been, just should have said in hardware um, in this, this example. Any other questions? Jamal, can you give me the mic? Um, hi, so why you choose uh, use priority and all chains? Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess we, we at some point, we did discuss chains, um, and priorities just seem to be a more natural match for um, for for OBS. But I guess we can discuss chains. Uh, yeah. So, so we know we're just discussing chain in any case for OBS for recirculation, for example. Yeah. So the re recirculation is, might be a little bit of a different use case. Um, I don't know. But, but yeah. Uh, but uh, as you it. mentioned, as you can start with. Priority number plus something. You can do the same thing with chain. Currently, yep. we chain starting working with chain zero. We can start with chain plus something. Yeah, I don't. Well, I think we, when we discussed it, we realized that both software model and hardware implementation supports the supports it also without chains. So we we kind of say, hey, let's do it simpler. I, I think. If I remember correctly, when we discussed it on the community yeah. calls, so. yeah, we did. We, we did have this. We we did consider the chains and um, yeah. And, and and what we're doing with the old API of the IP links at WAF rate? Because currently today, when customer is asking how I can do that, we point them to the old API of uh, virtual functions. Sure, yeah, but we do it only as a backdoor, Ronnie. <laughs> no, the, this is the way to do it because there is no other well, way for this, that. This all Stuff isn't for, it's not for the legacy mode, right? It's for the switch dev mode. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, the, this I, is the so I asked, I asked in switch dev mode today, you call it kind of a hack, that we're still supporting the old API of the legacy, the hyperlink set WAF, virtual function. So the question is, um, are we the same? As, as a community, we, as a community we want to go to, to his work. We want to go to, to the vendors will offload the, uh, I, I know you're joking, it's a Mellanox talk, but it's good. We're an open company. So we want to go to, um, to an approach of offloading policers. It, it applies to the OVS use case and also to other use cases. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so this is just, the, just to give a little background. The, the reason I would go with uh, this approach is because this is the OVS approach, right? Um, so for, for, for my use case, this makes sense. No, no, I, I totally agree. It makes sense. It's, it's good. I, I didn't say just some, you know, small comments. Okay, it's, it's fine. <laughs> You're doing our job. It's fine. Um, we're doing it together as a community. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Okay. Thank you, Peter.
Thank, thank you. Do you prefer me to? Okay, so I'll um, I'll talk today about uh, scalable hardware of hardware functions. We call it scalable hardware offloads. Uh, this is work being done by Parav um, uh, for the um, Connectix uh, devices, uh, but he was working uh, a lot recently on the software model and uh, GUI, Pirco, and also Jason. Uh, invested lots of thinking about um, the software model. I'm, I was less involved, but I'm happily um, presenting that. Um, so what do, we, what do we want to talk about? We want to both talk about um, scalable hardware functions. We call it hardware offloads, but the point is to get a uh, large amount of hardware functions uh, for uh, various use cases that we'll see that we needed that. So what, what would be the, um, the software model to do that, and why, and why did we choose this software model? Um, so um, PCI SRIOV uh, exists for a long time, and also Linux, uh, a few years ago, we kind of finally introduced a nice software model for that, for the backend devices, for the software side of the vSwitch. Uh, but it's not really scalable. You can maybe have tens of them, somehow 128 or a bit more, but it's not going to work for a very large number of uh, devices, specifically for containers that have very short-lived um, and other uh, use cases. Um, so we want, we want to find something that um, um, deploys in a faster rate, has a more scalable range. And um, uh, we want, we, this is one thing. Uh, and we, we just kind of discussed the various options in NetDev conferences, uh, I remember th at least three or four times. Uh, and it always crashed or didn't work out because we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't plug well to the vPort model, uh, which uh, by nature exists in, in SRIOV and all vendors support that. Um, so all vendors, I, I believe, have something that even if you don't call it this way, you have embedded switch in your hardware because when you virtualize the hardware, you have virtual ports and you have to, to do some sort of switching uh, between them. Even if it's uh, limited switching, like the VEPA stuff, stuff of, let's say, Intel chips for 10 or 12 years ago, or the modern, more modern NICs that can do not only VEPA uh, uh, switching. Um, so um, the, the solution we propose is to, um, on the one hand, avoid the SRIOV, but still split um, this is the hardware solution that we propose, and I, the more interesting stuff is, is the software model. I'll come to in a minute. So we, we want to, to um, uh, this is also something, I believe that other vendors could do that, maybe all of them, to split a PCI device into more, uh, more than, uh, smaller sub-devices, uh, that each sub-device has its own L2 queues or RDMA queues, whatever, but it has a vPort representation in hardware that can plug to all what we do in OBS, we talk about it here, and a namespace resources that it has some segregation and, and uh, security and all, all this stuff. And then if we manage to do that, uh, the nice thing is that we can leverage this switch dev uh, infrastructure in the kernel, which is there since kernel 4.8, 2016, and applies in OBS and uh, tralali, tralala in, all the, in the ecosystem. Uh, we, um, that would be a good, nice win. Um, one other thing that we want to uh, require is that um, uh, we want to also to be applicable for, for SmartNIC environment, okay? Um, uh, so there was a proposal uh, to create a virtual, a new virtual bus in Linux. It was extended of something that proposed 10 years ago. Uh, for KVM, it was not accepted, and it was reviewed with uh, Greg KH and the other guys. And um, after some review cycles, I, I was less uh, involved. Eventually, uh, people realized that in 4.10 of the kernel, uh, a new subsystem was introduced called MediAD devices. And this, uh, this software model of the MediAD devices have a very good fit to, to what we want to do here. So. Um, I will not um, introduce you fully now to MediaDB devices. I don't have enough time for that. But it has a notion of uh, MediaDB device driver and MediaDB device. Th does this have po pointing? Um, no. 
I know. Okay, so there is a mediated device driver, driver and mediated uh, device, and there is a bus for them, and um, um, these are the the the, the, um, the blue pieces on on the, on below, and then um, what is needed is a um, is a control plane knob to add, uh, create and query those uh, mediated devices in the NICU's case. Th those mediated devices uh, in the kernel. Were recently, were, when they, they introduced in 4.10 were more for GPUs and other stuff, NVIDIA, uh, and or other drivers. But now we, we, we had the cool use cases from NIC drivers in the kernel. I know that in user space in DPDK, Intel doing lots of work on um, with the VTPA, but, but this is a kernel implementation. So um, what you would do, you would use the, um, um, the DevLink control plane to create, uh, uh, create configure, uh, destroy those, um, those instances, and then um, the vendor has to write to, to register uh, a driver with the mediated devices infrastructure in the kernel. And then when, when an instance is created, um, in the end of the day, uh, for instance, in our case, we would create three devices. We would create a net device, an RDMA device, and a representer for the, for the, for the A-switch. RDMA is, of course, of course optional. Uh, the, broad the broader use case would be, of course, a net device. Uh, and then, once you have um, a net device, uh, which is based on this, uh, so, so we have a net device, we can provision it to a container, to a namespace, right? Obviously, we talk about it today. But on the other hand, this net device is built on something which is in software, is a mediated device, but in hardware, it's some hardware function that has a vPort. So now you can use this vPort in your OVS or your other vSwitch control plane and start to do offloading. So, so what you got? You got, you got a, a, a protocol device, and a device that has its own hardware queues, its own resources and namespace resources, and you can map it to a container or, or whatever applications that you use, DPDK even, but you also have, and, and of course the RDMA device, but, and also you have a representation in, in the vSwitch, so, so you got it. This is what we, um, um, all the time, Jamal, all the time, so we were talking about um, models, so, so it's always uh, not incomplete. And now, uh, hopefully, uh, so, so we, we got it. So we got something that is, is hardware offloaded network function, yeah. which has a vSwitch representation. Yes, so I can move it to a container, or I can... You, okay. In our implementation, you cannot map it to a virtual machine. But, okay, uh, but be because the driver, the, 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 the driver that controls that is MLX5 and not VFIO. But this, for if, if someone else uh, driver can support it with VFIO, it will be also ap applicable to virtual machines. The model supports that. So, S so you need to do SRIO V in order for it to be VM compatible. Is that true? No, no, no. <laughs> you, you for forget from SRIO V. Okay. You have only the physical function. You have right. a bare metal. Right. Now you start to carve more and more mediated devices on this single function. And in our implementation, you can only map them to container or other use cases, but you cannot map them to a virtual machine. If you want to send it to a virtual machine, you have to use VFIO, and so it's not the scope of today, well, but it supports that. Well, these things have what, two uh, Q, Q pair, I guess? What you can create as many Q pairs as you want, because but, you, you but do have a hardware function. A vPort has, oh, I see, exactly. No, you have, you have a, uh, uh, in Melox we call it sub-function, but it's, right. it's not the point here, it's just the, the name we gave it. So, so again, it's, it's, it's a bit, so you have, from PCI point of view, right. you have one function, the physical function. Uh, in our implementation, we take some bar of this function and we split it to multiple functions. That, that's fine. But the, the software representation, it's something called mediated device, and then you have um, the software representation of the function in the kernel, and then you have a net device created on this okay, net, and then you could put it in a container okay, and so on. Let, let, let me ask you it differently, maybe. So I create this thing, I guess, with what, IP link, blah. With dev link. Or dev link, okay, so I create it, it shows up as a net dev, I move it to a container, right. I can start using it, and I can do hardware offload on it. Hardware offload for the switching. Y uh, uh, on on the one hand, the uh, this uh, container has a net dev, which has real hardware queues, right? Their QPs are right. unique to them. It's not software queues, it's hardware queues. Uh, that's okay? right, but so I can, I can basically, can I install filters then that get offloaded? Yes. Actions, or you can do, more naturally, you can do the filters on the, now you have a model for, for vSwitch, so you can do the filters there. Okay, you have a representer. All we're talking on the on the uh, the bullshit. We're talking about representer for few years. Yeah, yeah, now yeah, they yeah, all I apply know, there. I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is 
Um, so if you're using the MDEV infrastructure, isn't that the VFIO stuff? I mean, why is I mean, it you, you have a choice in MDEV if to use VFIO or not. It's not mandatory. Oh, it's not mandatory. Okay. And do you uh, plan to her, do the her, VFIO stuff? Excuse me? You plan to implement the VFIO stuff as I well? I cannot or? comment on that. I don't... Okay. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here, here again. So here's the here's the um, uh, we have one PCI device, uh, the PF net device, uh, the PF device in this example, and then uh, we put multiple instances uh, on the on the on the MDEV bus. Uh, here it's UUID zero and then one and so on and so forth. And each one of them <coughs> correspond to um, a protocol device like NetDev and then. Uh, um, um, which is in the middle, the, the, um, the blue. Uh, then the light blue is the RDMA, and, the, and on the left side, the, the green one is the one that represents the, the e-switch side. Okay? As soon as you create this uh, creature, we, in our case, uh, the driver would, would, would react and create three, three devices. But on the general case, again, it's, it's one net device, device, net, dev net device, which is the NIC, the virtual NIC you hand to the container later. And then the, the switch port, which is also has a net device, is the representer. So, so one basic question, I guess, how is this different from the VF stuff? BF, VF because in the VF the stuff, each such net device is backed up by PCI different function. And here we I have one function that corresponds to multiple devices. Got it. Um, yes, yes. So um, you said you're not using a VFIO. Uh, is the, uh, the there is a copy involved? A what? Is there a copy involved from the container uh, packets? In no, because <laughs> it's a, it's a hardware queue, and we don't map it to a virtual machine. So it's it's our implementation is more limited than the user, the, the general case, because we all hook on the same PCI function. Um, but we still do some separation, so it's it's. I'm trying to understand the separation because you don't have a. The separation, separation is internal to our implementation, but the software model uses the M MDEVs. So from no, software wise, there's a, there's a software wise, you uh, like you you guys, Intel, you invented the, there is model of MDEV devices. So MDEV device no, no. is is a bunch of queues which are somehow related. No, no. That, and if your hardware can support VFIO, you can also do. Nine fingers that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's VMDQ, and I mean, we, we have uh, recently. Yes, but VMDQ, this is the, the stuff that we didn't converge on all those conferences because if you just VM, use VMDQ, we didn't have representation for the e switch, right? No, this is good. We uh -huh. have the representation. It makes yes. the uh, model. And I believe you're, um, I don't know, Andy, if you can comment or Netronome, do you, you think you can support it some? You, you want to give them the mic? Yeah. Uh, I, can just, I can just say yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, loud enough. <laughs> yeah. And Netronom, uh, what do you think? Did you have? Well, I can always use more words. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is something that very similar that we've talked about because I think there are a lot of the limitations you describe are limitations that we see as well. So um, I'm glad you're presenting this. I'm, you know, hate that you beat <laughs> us to the punch, but that's okay. And Simon, question. Ah, yes. So. <coughs> Is there a reason the current Mac VLAN approach is not suitable for? Yes, because if you think about it, draw it on a piece of paper. For Mac, the Mac VLAN approach, you don't you don't have a software model to put rules for that coming from the VM. It's only one-sided. <laughs> I see. Basically, the representer is not there. That is the reason, right? So even with Mac VLAN, we could create a port representer. But only for one direction. You have this oh. patch on John Fastenband. Mm -hmm. But it's only do half of the work. Think about it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think this is actually better It's confusing this feature that you have. Um, actually, I have one more question. You mentioned about uh, subdividing the bar for each of those. Yes, devices. this is implementation. It's internal implementation. Yeah. That's what you need to do. Yes, but you so could you could do it in multiple ways. The point is that if you know to plug to the MDEV uh, subsystem. Right. Um, so let's see if it's really, um, um, yes, so I explained that, um, yes, th these are details that which are less, uh, um, 
important. So again, we use the MDEV subsystem, which is, exists and has an ecosystem and, it, and was uh, hopefully cool and easy to understand by users. We, we also use the, how we, we managed to get into the hardware model of having a V port for each just uh, such entity and now we can uh, uh, make use of that. The one use case, the obvious use case is containers. Uh, we have another use cases that I will, uh, uh, tomorrow I have a session on um, uh, live migration uh, with uh, virtual functions. So we, uh, we, do, we use those new uh, uh, mediated devices for the host side of this live migration buildup. And tomorrow it will be too complex to uh, explain, but um, just remember this for tomorrow. <laughs> No, remember the stuff that when I will talk about other um, how to function, I will refer to this, these guys. Um, anything else? Ah, yes. Do we have like two minutes? Um, no. Yes. So no. <laughs> it's okay, the end of the day. It's the end of the day. But no, no, we can, we can. Uh, if people. No, just kidding, man. Just. Kidding. Ah, they're joking. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Go, okay. So when you. Um, I guess your implementation is still internal at this point, or have you? No, 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 no. It's an RFC on NetDev. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, sure. Missed the memo. Well, that's good. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the RFC on NetDev, it's not a, it's not a full implementation, but it's the, it has all the, um, um, excuse me, all, all the binding points for for the dev link for, for, like you can see the skeleton of what sh, what ops you have to expose the the. The MLX5 part is more, more of a skeleton, but it has all the registrations for that. Okay, perfect. You can copy. <laughs> so, so first question is, uh, a, another resource that's limiting the uh, amount of these devices you might be able to create could be the MSAX vectors? So do you have a yes, our implementations, uh, our, our implementation, I'm not, this is what I know, maybe I'm here no more. I think we share the IRQs between, as I said, it's not a real, it's not a fully virtualized, uh, so for instance, IRQs are shared, but maybe it's good. You don't want to have t tens of thousands of IRQs. I agree it's good, but can't, doesn't that break the model for the separation between them? Uh, yeah, um, it's a good question, I, I'm not, we have to see on uh, the implementation. Some what security? Yeah, I, yes, but as long as you don't um, you don't map it to virtual machines, it can still be secure, I believe. Okay. And the dev link, yeah, it's a dev link. Uh, um, we forgot to do here a slide, but on the RFC uh, and the RFC um, uh, that we present, we really show the flow. So initially, you generate some UUID, and then you use this UUID with DevLink to create the the new device. DevLink is just the hook to get into the kernel to the MDev infrastructure. Yes, but uh, again, the Anjali and Ariel, the patches are on NetDev, so do do comment there. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, do you uh, plan to implement some kind of uh, programmability to the S embedded switch, like uh, between the between these new uh, NetDev representors? For example, you can you can XDP redirect or XDP drop between those. So uh, okay, so the 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 light green uh, um, devices here, what we call port representers. The control plane to uh, the control plane knob to configure them is TC Flower. This mm -hmm. is also something that we kind of de facto um, standardize in, the, in the, our small community. Um, it's more of a switch. It's, it's less of XDP uh, way of programming for for a NIC. It's more of a open. It's more thinking about more of open flow rules that you have a source port, a match, an action. An action can be dropped forward, but you can also apply VLAN push and pop. Overland networks, uh, soon connection tracking. Th these are the more of, uh, more of the type you work with. This. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, on the virtual NIC you can put the XDP, of course. Yes, on the on the on the on the on the. Ma yes. So sorry for. Thank you. Ah, hi. Yeah. Didn't see you for a long time. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you can see it very very. Uh, the same way as we're working with SwitchDev today, uh, 
um, switch dev mode. So for SRIOV, for virtual functions, it's actually the same thing almost, but without the PCI stuff. So instead of uh, slicing the PCI to PCI functions, it's we're slicing it for MDEVs. Um, each vendor can contain um, a NEDEV, so it's up to the vendor to, to implement a NEDEV and to support whatever it is supporting. And what is the other way, and the other side of the, this NEDEV is, it's of course the representer of the switch port. I think for, for this, the question of the Mac villain, I think it also can be work if we will still support it in the legacy mode even. You don't you need to be, to yeah. I don't, you don't want a representer, don't have one. You can still have the same, same thing. So, but it's a standard NET device. You have two NET devices, as you mentioned. Okay, so there are two NET devices. What net, single NET device? It's like you probe uh, the virtual function. It's a fully NET device that can support everything. It can support XDP. It can support uh, also uh, TC for slow, for, that it can use the hardware, but is the, the, the hardware of the port, the virtual port. So everything is, can be supported, it can be extended, depend on the hardware limitation, of course. Um, so we were going between multiple choices over the years in this conference, and, and we took the VETH approach, <coughs> but we didn't do a VETH, we didn't, the, we didn't add an offload to the VETH driver, but we choose an attitude that allows, allows us to come with a hardware way of doing VETH. Uh, but but the, 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 um, the drivers that runs in the container is the, is the vendor driver, is the Broadcom or Netronom or Melon's driver, and, and just the device it is working on is this stuff. Thank you. And, and I just want to mention that um, the, the idea was more for containers because if you use virtual functions for a virtual machine, then you have a resource limitation on the PCI. And here we want something, and you didn't. You, and when you want to create more virtual function, you you need to reset the PCI, the virtual function numbers. And here you can create them dynamically for for containers. For each containers, you get a NET device. You can create using an OVS, uh, a CNI that's implementing, and we also support kind of that. Uh, we implemented a, a, a CNI, it's like for a Nuage CNI, and also for now for OVN CNI, that's using OVS, both of them. Um, it's using the same hardware offload, and instead of giving them the VTHs that they're using today, we just give them a representer and a net dev, and everything continue to work the same. What? How do you create them? So it's of course a hard limitation. Thousands. Thousands. I know you're trying to dismiss. You're villain, back to Mac villains. We, we I explain like you. Mac it's villains. broken. I always liked Mac <laughs> villains. <laughs> no, no, I mean I still use them. I mean I have a Niantic. It works well. The one nice thing is that yeah, I can use things like load balancing, or even with RSS, okay? And I can shove them into different containers and, and start sending packets to the different Mac villains in different containers. Something as trivial as RSS, for example. But it doesn't have a proper switching model, Jamal. We were talking about this yeah, thousand yeah, times. Yeah, the, the switching model that's like. We talked about the infinite number of times, so. Right, all right. Why, why do you? Can you offload rules in hardware in this? Yes, right. yes, yes. And I can do everything that I could do on a traditional Melanox port. For you, yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you guys.